Welcome, Drink with James, episode 156. As I said, we are filming a double header, well, kind of, back to back. I filmed yesterday, I'm filming today, I'm speaking to you from the past. Today is July 3rd, so if something terrible has happened to the world, if, you know, and this video comes out, um, and I didn't know that that terrible thing was gonna happen, I guess we're just happily living in our bliss of, of not knowing the future. Um, but I'm speaking to you future people weeks in advance because this is a short week due to the 4th of July. I'm not a total monster. I closed the office on the 5th, um, so letting people take the rest of this week off. And then all of next week I have meetings, and then I'm also out of town. Doesn't matter, end of the day. This is my last day in the office for like a week and a half. So. You might ask, what am I drinking? Embarrassingly, and I don't do this to y'all very often, I am drinking water. <clears throat> mm. I'm drinking water um, because it's also 2 p.m. And I just can't drink and, at 2 p.m. and then have like the four or five more meetings that I have the rest of this day. That is something that has changed in my life quite a bit over the last two years is that I really have no kind of say over my schedule anymore. I, I look at my day sometimes, I don't know how. I get eight to nine hours of meetings put on my schedule every day, but that has become my life. Um, and it's weird to become one of those people that like, and I, again, I don't feel good about this, I don't think this makes me cool, I think it's like kind of tragic, but like one of those people where someone will be like, a friend will text and be like, oh, like, let's hang out. And one, I have to like embarrassingly be like, is it cool if I kick you to my assistant uh, to take care of that? Cause like I'm incompetent and like incapable of scheduling this dinner with you. Um, but also being like, I can definitely have a drink with you in four to six weeks. Um, please tell me which of these two days at these very specific times makes sense for you. But you know, I think that's one of the parts of, of getting busy or, or, or growing this company is that I very much feel like a, I'm in service of it, right? And so I just kind of have to do what the company needs me to do. And right now it needs me to sit in meetings for nine hours a day and then uh, travel to like six or seven cities over the next, you know, 10 days to try and spread the gospel. And I am, I am happy to operate in that capacity. So that's all to say, I'm filming this very early. Um, so if Instagram shut down in the last few weeks, <coughs> then just ignore this video um, because it's not going to make much sense anymore. But let's get into the questions. Before we do question one, do y'all ever like drink water? I so rarely drink water. I am like a, I am like a shriveled like prune or something. I I'm so bad at hydrating, um, and when I do, I drink like, like I drink like, probably like six to ten Lacroix a day. My teeth are probably just gonna fucking rot out of my mouth. Um, but I'm drinking this water right now. It is delicious. You guys should drink more water. Mmm, that's actually pretty good. Um, When's the last time you had a glass of water? I, honestly, I don't know. Uh, the last time I had a glass of water, I'm not sure. I guess, yeah, it's been a minute. Um, it's been a minute. It's like weeks, months. I don't know. I, I, you know, I drink a lot of LaCroix, which is essentially water. Uh, and some like Miller High Life, which again, is essentially water. So I think I hydrate decently well. <music> Question number one is, how do I get collaborations if I have low engagement? One, may not be a big problem in the near future because they're going to start hiding likes. So you do whatever the fuck you want. Uh, just live free, baby. Um, two, let's make sure you have, you don't have great engagement. Let's put up, let's put up the average engagement by tier for the platform. So these averages are across our 80,000 influencers. This is kind of where you should be. So if you're below that, yes, you do have low engagement. I'm sorry. Um, how should you handle it? Um, one, I think I... If it were me, let's say I had 100,000 followers and at my level, the average engagement was 2% and I had 
Um, that's dramatic. That's 100% lower. That's that's not a small amount. Uh, I would, and again, this is we talked about this in the episode with Patrick, um, and he said he doesn't do this. But Patrick, I love you, but I think I would if it were me. I would get ahead of it. You know, um, I might mention the if. Okay, let me step back. I guess there's two things. If the brand comes to you and they want to work with you, then like, don't say a thing. You know, I think when I was talking to Patrick and he said that he doesn't bring it up, it's because he is getting reached out to, right? So like, if someone reaches out to you, you don't have to be like, super excited to work with you. I do want you to know I have bad engagement. Um, like that is not really helpful. Um, if you feel like, you don't have great engagement, but and you're not getting brand deals because of that, I think you need to, when you reach out to brands, you need to bring up the engagement right away. I think you need to say, you're gonna look at my account, you're gonna see this engagement number, let me explain why that is the way it is. And don't, whatever you do, don't say, oh my God, my engagement was 50% better last week, but the algorithm is just fucking killing me, and like, it's not my fault. Like, I don't know what's going on. My engage I mean, how many people are just like, that tell me all the time when I, you know, defend the algorithm that, you know, in the last month, Instagram is, is you know, cut their engagement in half. It, it, again, for somebody working in the industry, when I hear that, I'm just like, I shut off, right? I'm just like, I have no interest in hearing anything else you have to say because, again, the algorithm is not predatory, is not going after you. Um, it is true that your content may not be very interesting to your audience anymore. They may not be engaging with it and that not engaging with it compounds itself. And that's the difficulty with poor engagement is that it, it trends downward, right? The worse your engagement gets, the worse your reach gets because the algorithm isn't serving that content to your followers and it just keeps sliding down and down and down and down. And then it's really hard to correct that path because um, Instagram is no longer serving your content to your audience, so it's difficult to bring them back in and get them to engage. Now, I think even if you have bad engagement, and I, I will actually answer the question eventually, but even if you have poor engagement, I think what I would probably do is I would focus not on just doing the same thing over and over again, but trying to get like a big winner, right? Like I usually get like four, 350 to 600 likes on a photo, let's say, right? I don't have very good engagement. Um, sometimes I'll get like 1,000 to 1,200. I would probably focus on, and when I get that, my reach is usually like, my average reach is let's say 6,000. I have 24,000 followers. My average reach is around 6,000. When I do the like 1,000, 1,200, 1,500 likes, I do like between 10 and 13,000 in reach. So like in that, instance when I have those photos that really take off my reach doubles so like in the short term I would focus on those big winners and I wouldn't focus as much honestly on like consistency or things like that I would just step back and see like how can I get a big winner and if I can get two or three of those in a row do I start to kind of retrain the algorithm a bunch of people have now liked these posts is my stuff showing up more I think you need to like figure out a way to break out of the thing that thing that is holding you back and again there's this frustration that is like yeah the content that I usually posted and it would get all this engagement isn't getting engagement anymore but like what frustrates me is that influencers like reaction to that is to just post more of that content that isn't getting good engagement so listen to the performance try and find those winners to try and claw yourself out of that hole because that hole does just get deeper and deeper and deeper if your engagement is sliding. So that's, that's that. I would try and get ahead of it, right? If, if I had 100K and I had poor engagement and I was reaching out to a brand, I would discount my rates because my engagement wasn't as good, you know? Um, and by how much? I think I would discount my rates by how much I thought my engagement was down because again, engagement does follow reach. So like smart marketers now, people that know what they're doing, if your engagement is under a percentage point, let's say, and they 
know it's half as what it should be. They also know that like, unless Instagram is working much different for you than most people, that you're reaching half as many people as the people at your similar following level. So in what world would I pay you the same that I'm gonna pay someone else, knowing that if I work with that other person with better engagement and thus better reach, that my money is going to go twice as far. Just think about it yourself. Like if you were going to a restaurant and there were two cheeseburgers and one of them cost $15 and one of them cost 30 and they were the same exact cheeseburger, which one would you get? Like, of course you would get the $15 one every time. If your engagement is bad and your reach is bad and you're not adjusting your pricing, that is what it looks like. It looks like you're walking in trying to sell me a $30 cheeseburger when I see the cheeseburger on the menu is $15. And like, it's never gonna work for you. So I think you have to discount your rates and you have to get ahead of that and say like, totally, you know, just want you to know, I've been struggling a little bit with engagement. I'm doing a bunch of things right now. It seems to be turning it around, but in the short term, I'm gonna give you a discount because I know I'm not reaching as many people as I should be right now. That's a very honest conversation uh, it's a difficult one to have, uh, but I think that if you're not getting work because of your engagement, you have to meet it head on. I think I've said before to like go back and watch Eight Mile and that last, you know, that last rap battle scene with Eminem where he he says every insult that the guy's about to say about him, um, and then the guy doesn't have anything to say, right? It's like do that but just like for pitching yourself as an influencer, right? Like if there's anything that you feel like could get them to say no, then just address it because when you address it, you get to craft the narrative. You know, it's so frustrating to us. We just heard from a client we really wanted to work with that we lost a deal. It's a $180,000 deal. That sucks for us. Um, and the brand told us why we lost it. And it was frustrating because they just misunderstood our offering. Like the reason they said that they weren't gonna work with us was absolutely not a valid reason not to work with us, but they never mentioned it. And so in that case, our inability to frame what they saw as a weakness lost us the deal. So if you don't talk about your bad engagement, they're gonna make up their own story about it, um, which is probably a lot worse than the truth of it. So it behooves you to get ahead of it. Question number two. Do I think there's a difference between content creators and influencers and do brands think they're the same? I think, when I think about, yeah, think about the space and I think about, let's again look at someone with 100,000 followers. I think a lot of the industry sees someone with 100,000 followers and says that's an influencer and I think that's where a lot of the problems in understanding the space and being effective in the space come from. That having 100,000 followers does not mean you are an influencer, it means you have 100,000 followers. Um, the way we think about it is an influencer is somebody who has influence over people, right? It's somebody that their audience listens to them in some way. Generally, the way we think about it is that they are, are some sort of expert on a certain, you know, uh, there's some sort of topic expert, beauty, fashion, you know, their travel or, you know, travel, cars, gaming, whatever it might be. They, or it could be lifestyle, right? Like, and they just have a certain lifestyle that they um, have been able to craft that's like really appealing. So. Influencers to us are people that are talking about brands a lot um, and they are influencing people's decision making, right? So they are, uh, I'm following you because I trust your opinion on something and I want to see what you're talking about. Or it can be a lifestyle thing of like, you have great taste in restaurants and you go out a lot, so I want to follow you because I want to see where you're eating, or you always go on amazing vacations and I want to see where you're traveling. So in our, our mind, that is an influencer. Um, 
then we have people who have an audience, and that is just, you have an audience, you have people that are following you. Maybe you're genetically gifted, and you're very, you're incredibly good looking, and like, you know, like it or not, it's, it's sometimes it's just nice to see really good looking people pop into your, uh, pop into your feed every once in a while. And so you have a following, but in our mind, you don't have as much of an ability to influence that following because the thing they are interested in is not your point of view in the world, not the restaurants you're going to or the brands that you're going, you know, that you work with or the new beauty hack you came up with or what foundation you're using. They're interested in looking at you or just in you specifically um, and not so much in the way you see the world. Content creator kind of sits out on the side is, you know, it's different than having an audience because it's not about, it's not a you focused feed, right? So most content creators um, are very much behind the lens or they're artists or whatever it might be. Um, but the feed is not focused on them necessarily or at all, uh, but rather in like the way they see or interpret the world and that is interesting. I think that content creators certainly can be influencers, right? Like I, you know, we had Joe Greer speak at our conference. He is a photographer and, uh, and an artist and a, con a content creator. He's not an influencer in my mind, but I bought my camera because of him. You know, I bought my film Leica from following his account. So he, for me, is very influential when he's talking about cameras. He influences the way I shoot. He influences maybe the places I want to go to shoot. Um, <clears throat> but he is not, I would not call him an influencer. So to answer the question, like, I think there's a huge difference between having an audience, being an influencer, and being a content creator. I do not think brands generally see the difference, but the brands that are good at this and are getting more strategic are understanding when do I need to use a content creator who can create beautiful things for me? When do I need to use an influencer who can tell a really compelling brand story for me? Or when do I need to use someone for audience and just get my name in front of people um, and get a bunch of scale? Again, the lines can blur there are big celebrities who have huge influence. Look at, the, you know, look at the Kardashians, right? We wouldn't call them influencers, but obviously they're incredibly influential. There are content creators that are influencers. Um, there are influencers who create beautiful content, like a Tezza. So like, the lines do blur, but we definitely see there being lines. And I think, important to understand where you stand because I think it will, it is not currently incre it, like affecting the price of what you pay for, for a post that much. I think in the future it will, All right? So like in our opinion, somebody who has an audience for someone who has influence, you should pay a lot more for the person who has influence over the person who has an audience. That's not the case yet in the industry. We are pushing to make it so. Uh, but I think that like that's definitely something that is going to happen is we're going to start to delineate those two things and say, wait, hold on, just because you have 150,000 followers doesn't mean they give a shit about what your skincare routine is. And why would I pay you the same as a beauty skincare influencer who their 150,000 followers absolutely care about their skincare routine? They care passionately about that influencer skincare routine, right? That doesn't make sense. So I think that will start to change. And the content creator side, it's, I think it, it is, it's an interesting, like, what do I want to say? It's like, a, it's on the content creator side, it kind of blurs two models, right? Like if you have 10,000 followers, well, let's look at my friend, Aaron, right? Like he's only got 2000 followers. He's a great photographer. He makes his, and filmmaker, he makes his career as a filmmaker and a photographer. He's obviously not being paid for his posts. He only has 2,000 followers. He's charging day rates. You know, the brands like when he posts, and if he had 50,000 followers, he definitely wouldn't be paid 
again, he wouldn't be paid off of those followers. He's getting paid a day rate. So I think for most content creators, until you get a huge following, it makes a lot more sense to be charging for a day rate and having your following be like a kicker. Um, probably until you get over 300,000 followers um, is, is kind of when I could start to see the posts on your feed starting to um, compete with your day rate as far as the amount of money you can make. This is predicated on you actually having some talent, um, I might say. So like a normal up and coming photographer in fashion, I think you're looking at like, you know, 750 to 1500 for a day rate is like pretty fair, I think. That's not for editorial. Editorial is zero dollars. There's no money in editorial, obviously. Um, so as you get better, day rates get to two or three or five thousand dollars a day. Again, it would get hard to make that much money off your Instagram account. So I think for content creators, probably still makes sense to focus on making your money in the more traditional way of a day rate, but thinking about your following as a marketing funnel for bringing in new clients. So I definitely would post your clients even if they're not paying for it. Um, it's going to make them super happy and uh, it's definitely going to bring a new business and, and treat that Instagram as your, as your marketing funnel. Question number three is where can I find out information if influencers are relevant in my industry? I think it's important to think about influencers as a new way to execute advertising, right? And so if influencers are just a marketing channel, a new and exciting marketing channel, but a marketing channel, then think about what industries marketing is relevant for, and that is essentially every industry. Now, it's also a new channel, so it's not fully matured. Right? And so there definitely are pockets where it is harder to find influencers who are focused on those things, um, right? Like for a, let's think about like a company that does, you know, that are, that's very much B2B on an enterprise level and is making like wind turbines, right? Like, okay, probably not a huge place for influencers there. Right? Like it's, it's probably like your audience that you're trying to market to or sell to is probably not on Instagram and like what are people going to say about en enormous wind turbines on Instagram. But I think companies that get really big where people don't know what they do um, start to think about advertising as like more of a PR thing, right? Of like they just want to get their name known a little bit and so there are ways for companies that don't necessarily traditionally make sense um, to get their get the word out. Um, that might be around something they're doing with a charity. Um, maybe they have some kind of fun project that they're working on. Maybe it's a, a big gala event that they do and they invite influencers to. Like, as a brand, there's not a lot of brands out there that don't want more people knowing what they are. Um, and so I think that we will see as time progresses and as this space becomes more important and influential, businesses using influencers, businesses that, that understand that there's no consumer side to their business will use influencers to maybe shed light on the corporate good work that they're doing or some of the other things that they're doing to kind of get some goodwill in the space, get some some name recognition out there um, to maybe counteract the fact that they're like, you know, dumping millions of tons of toxic chemicals into rivers every day, you know? Um, that's tr traditionally how like those brands have used advertising <clears throat> is to try and like, maybe because they're so not in the public sphere, they want to own that narrative and be able to say like, if anyone knows anything about us, we want it to be this thing that we do, this nice, again, this, this really great 
charity work we do or you know corporate good we're doing or some new initiative or some new little project we're, we're working on or we did a co-branded thing with this other brand that is more consumer facing so I think the way you to get back to the actual question I'm, I'm, I'm going off on tangents a lot today um, how do you find out if they're they're influential in your industry um, well I think that like the easiest way is to probably like, if you're not a first mover, is to probably see if your competitors start using them. And, but I would say that almost every industry, there is something that your business or brand could do with an influencer um, to help move the needle on your business and, and kind of um, do some good for you. So I think it would be a very rare business, and I'm sure if I thought about it, we could come up with examples, but it would be very rare where it would 100% absolutely never make sense. It depends largely on the messaging, and again, for those alternative industries, the ones that are more B2B, I think it's going to be more about very much not product-based, but company-focused. So, okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I am going out into the world. I am not going to film one of these for two weeks, so I will be collecting data. I am sure I will get pissed off about something in the next few weeks, so I didn't really rant in this episode, but I bet when we come back I will be gearing up for a fight. So we'll see you then.